Welcome to MobiTrack LTPB Basic and Intermediate Training. This is Session 8. In our last two sessions, we explored terminal control mode pretty thoroughly, and we learned how to control our VFD using a variety of techniques involving switches and potentiometers. Now, you probably thought you were all done with terminal control mode, but actually this session is kind of an extension of terminal control mode. We're going to look at how we can interface external devices like sensors to our VFD, and we're going to learn how to control external devices using the built-in relay contacts. So let's go ahead and see how we can interface with sensors and relays. We'll begin by working with sensors. There are many different kinds of sensor devices that you can interface to your MobiTrack LTPB. I'm not going to get into these in great detail because almost everything I'm going to tell you will work with almost any kind of generic sensor. Let's establish a few big ideas here. First of all, most external sensors are used to trigger VFD faults, causing it to stop the motor. The purpose of the sensor is to detect a problem alert the VFD to it, and bring it to a halt. There are certainly other kinds of sensors, but we're going to focus primarily on what are commonly called external fault sensors. Fault sensors are usually active low. In other words, they behave like a normally closed switch. When everything is normal and everything is fine, they're outputting a high signal. They go low when the fault occurs. It's like a normally closed switch that opens. The MobiTrack LTPB supports four different terminal control variants that can monitor an external sensor. Plus, of course, there's always the totally custom one as well, so really I guess you could say there are five, but we'll be looking at the four predefined ones. A very good example of an external fault sensor is the motor temperature sensor that's built into many motors that's designed to detect when the motor's getting too hot. The TH or thermostat type sensor and the TF or thermistor type sensor are very popular. Both of these can easily be interfaced to a MobiTrack LTPB and function as an external sensor that can shut it down. So how do we connect up sensors? Well, of course, we connect them up as we do almost all I.O. devices to the I.O. connector on the front of the VFD. So to connect any generic active low sensor, connect it up to digital input 5, and be sure to connect its power supply ground to the VFD's zero-volt ground connection so everything's at the same reference potential. Connecting up a temperature sensor is almost the same with a few slight variations. If you're using a TH or TF sensor, in other words a thermostat or a thermistor, you can use the built-in 24 volt supply on the VFD. It can supply enough current to energize these, and you would connect the sensor between the 24 volt supply and digital input five. Incidentally, this is just a reminder, but your sensor needs to have a 2.5K ohm threshold in order to work properly. Alternatively, you can use an advanced thermistor like a KTY84 or PT1000. You would wire this up in almost the same way, except you would connect it up between the 10 volt power supply and digital input 5 instead. Once you have your sensor wired up, of course, you need to switch to terminal control mode and pick a variant that monitors the sensor. So parameter 1-12 and 1-15 in the basic parameters are what you need to go to to set up for sensor monitoring. You would set parameter 1-12 to 0, that's just terminal control mode, and then you would connect parameter 1-15 to one of these four possible variants, 6, 7, 16, or 17. All of these can monitor external sensors. Now, if you're going to monitor a temperature sensor, you do need to do one additional thing. You need to go to parameter 2-33 in the extended parameters and specify the temperature sensor type you're monitoring. If you're monitoring a TH or TF sensor, then you will want to set it to PTC-TH. These are all the possibilities that you can choose. Not all of these have to do with temperature sensors because what this is really doing, it's configuring analog input 2 to the correct voltage format. If you're using a TH or TF sensor, select option 2. That's the one shown above. And if you're using a KTY or PT1000 sensor, then pick one of these here. Notice they have different trip and reset values, so you'll need to find the one that matches your particular motor temperature sensor. 
What will happen if you get a fault response caused by an external sensor depends how you have it configured. If you have it wired up as a generic fault sensor, when digital input 5 goes low, you will get the message eTrip on the VFD's display. If you've configured it as a temperature sensor and set its type, you will see F-PTC instead. It means exactly the same thing, it just means the temperature sensor has trip digital input 5. Now what do you do when this happens? Well, you need to obviously clear the fault by eliminating the cause. That could be allowing the motor to cool down, or if it's some other kind of external sensor, clearing the cause that triggered it. And then once you've done this, you can clear the fault by pressing the stop button on the VFD or by providing a rising edge on digital input one. That means turning it off and then on again. That will clear the fault and the VFD will be able to run again. Now, this is a good place to mention a warning here. Depending how you've configured the VFD when you clear a fault, the VFD may restart the motor immediately as soon as you've cleared that fault. So be sure you've taken all suitable precautions before clearing faults. Otherwise, you could have the motor start unexpectedly and somebody get hurt or something get damaged. So be aware of that, be prepared. You shouldn't have any problems if you take normal precautions. We will talk about how to configure the motor's restart behavior in another session. I think it's time for a demonstration. Let's go ahead and duck into LT Shell, and I'm going to set up my VFD demo unit to demonstrate both a generic external sensor and a motor temperature sensor. So let's go into LT Shell and set that up. All right, well, we're in LT Shell. We're ready to set up our VFD in order to monitor an external fault sensor. I have already scanned in. You've seen me do this enough times. I don't have to do it anymore in every session. So you can just assume when you see LT Shell that we're already connected. What I do need to do, however, is turn on real-time edit mode before I go in and start changing parameters. Now, I have been playing with my VFD since our last session. So this is not where we were last time. So I'm going to do everything necessary to get things set up to monitor an external sensor right now. The first thing we have to do is be sure we're in terminal control mode. So we go to parameter 1-12 and make sure it's set to terminal control. It isn't. It's actually set to keypad mode. So I'm going to go and set it to zero terminal mode. Then I have to go to parameter 1-15 and pick a variant that supports monitoring an external sensor. Remember I said 6, 7, 16, and 17 all support that. I'll just go ahead and pick 6 right here. This is a convenient variant. It's got a stop-run switch, forward-reverse. It can use a potentiometer or a preset speed 1. And notice digital input 5 at the end is set to external trip. So this is perfect. I'll be able to control my VFD conveniently and also monitor that sensor. Now that is all I have to do. We're now ready to go. One thing I do need to remember to do, however, before running my VFD is turn the external sensor to the high state. Remember, fault sensors are active low, so if that input is low, I'm just going to get a trip the minute I try to run my VFD. Now, I've got a potentiometer on my VFD on that input, so I'm going to just turn it all the way up. That'll behave like a switch that's turned on or a fault sensor that's in a normal condition not showing a fault. And to trigger a fault, I'm just going to turn that knob down till the voltage drops enough for it to be perceived as a low, and we should get a trip at that point. So let's turn off real-time edit mode, and let's head off to our VFD and see if that happens. All right, well, notice we've got digital input 5 turned all the way up, so it's not going to be in a trip state at this point. So now we're ready to test it. Let's start our VFD and just turn up the speed a little bit. Now we're going to trip our sensor by turning the potentiometer down till we cross the threshold. And there we go. We've got an e-trip. All right, well, let's clear our fault by turning the potentiometer all the way up again so the sensor is no longer triggering the VFD. And let's clear the fault by pressing stop. By the way, you notice it restarts right away. No warning. All right, let's trip it again. There we go, another e-trip, and this time we're going to reset it by using digital input 1, so let's get rid of the fault by turning the potentiometer all the way up. 
and then we'll generate an edge on digital input one by turning it off and on. And there you go, it restarts again. Okay, well it doesn't take much to change our VFD to monitor a motor temperature sensor when it's already been set up to monitor a fault sensor. The two are practically the same thing, we just have to change one parameter. So I'll turn real-time edit mode back on, and I'm going to go to parameter group two and find parameter 33. And this is analog input two format, so this is where we have our sensor connected up, digital input five, analog input two. We need to set this correctly so that the VFD will know when the temperature sensor has crossed its threshold. Let me just roll down here, and then I'm going to pop the list down, and you can see we have lots of choices. I said we're going to simulate a motor thermistor. We could also use this option to simulate a thermostat, which is a switch type device. So we'll pick option two, and we'll turn off real time edit mode. And now, when we trip our sensor, we should get a thermistor type fault. So let's go and do that by turning our potentiometer down while the motor's running and see if it trips and gives us that special motor warning message. Okay, let's test our simulated temperature sensor. Again, the potentiometer's turned all the way up, so we're not triggering a fault at this point. Let's start our VFD by turning digital input one on and turning up the speed potentiometer. And now let's trip our sensor by turning it down and there we go we have our temperature fault let's clear it by turning the tensiometer back up and we'll press stop to clear the fault notice it restarts immediately let's turn the potentiometer down trip it one more time there we go let's clear the fault by turning the potentiometer all the way up and then generating an edge on digital input one by turning it off and then on and there we go, we immediately start running again without warning. We should always remember that that can happen. And one final comment before we end this little demonstration. Did you notice that we got an e-trip first and then a temperature fault? So actually two faults occurred when we crossed the threshold, a generic e-trip and then a temperature sensor fault. But notice the temperature sensor fault is the one that stayed on the display because that was sort of the priority fault. All right, well now let's move on to another topic, one that's closely related. We're going to look at using the relays, which provide us a way of giving status information back through external devices. Just a reminder here, the MobiTrack LTPB has two relays. They're controlled and configured identically, although as you recall from the last session, they are not identical relays. Relay 1 has both normally open and normally closed contacts, whereas Relay 2 has just a normally open contact. Also, you might want to review the relay's electrical specifications here. Remember, they cannot handle large amounts of current. If you need to control something bigger than the relay can handle, then what you should probably do is connect it up to another relay of some kind to control the actual device. Despite the fact that the relays are internally different from each other, they are set up identically, so we're going to just cover how to set one up, and you can apply that to either one of these. So what kind of things do you use relays for with a VFD? Well, there are many possible applications. These are just a few. The relays can provide status feedback to a controller of some kind, such as a PLC or other digital controller. If you're using a PLC to control your VFD in terminal control mode and it's providing information to operate the VFD, the VFD can send feedback to it through a relay contact. For example, you can connect up the PLC's 24 volt supply to the relay reference contact and then connect either the normally open or the normally closed contact to one of its 24 volt digital inputs. You can then configure the relay within the VFD to provide status to the PLC. This could be as simple as telling the PLC if the VFD is healthy, or it could indicate if the VFD is running, or if the VFD is faulted, or if the VFD is operating at a certain speed. There are lots of possibilities here, so bear this in mind. This is a good application of the relay. Relay contacts, of course, can control external devices. For example, we have a status indicator here that shows red or green. This can be easily controlled by the VFD. 
For example, if you connect a power supply up to Relay 1's reference contact, and then you connect one of the indicators to the normally open contact and the other to the normally closed, when the relay switches, the light will change between red and green. You can also use the relay contact to control a brake if you have a brake motor of some kind. You will need a brake controller to do this, but there are many options available. This is a typical setup using the SEW Eurodrive BMK brake controller, which is designed to be used with VFDs. Usually you control the brake through Relay 2. You would connect a 24 volt supply to Relay 2's reference contact. You would connect the normally open contact to the BMK brake controller's trigger input. Of course, you would have to supply suitable brake power to the BMK. That's shown there. The voltage, of course, would depend on your particular brake. And then you would connect the brakes red, white, and blue wires to the controller as well. When the VFD closes the relay, that would cause the brake to release, and when the relay opens, it would cause the brake to engage. We'll talk about this more later in this session. While we're on the subject of brakes, probably a good idea to give you a brief warning. When you're controlling a brake, you need to be sure to follow all the guidelines specified in the Movitrack LTPB manual. This is especially crucial when you're using the VFD with angled or vertical applications, such as hoists. These are very critical because obviously you don't want anything to fall and cause injury or damage. This is discussed very thoroughly in the manual, so be sure you read up everything you need to know before working with one of those applications. So how do we configure the relay and what can we do with it? Parameter 2-15 and 2-18 and the extended parameters configure the relay behavior. Parameter 2-15 is for Relay 1 and 2-18 is for Relay 2, but they are identical in what you do with them. These are the things that you can set it up to indicate. The default is 1, which is drive healthy, but you can choose any of these. We'll talk about most of these, although the ones near the end of the list are more advanced topics that we won't cover in this class. The top four indicate the VFD's status. This is very useful if you're communicating back to a controller of some kind. The relay contact will close when the condition is true. So let's look at an example so you can get a feel for this. We'll look at the default, which is number one, drive healthy. This particular option indicates if the VFD is faulted or if the VFD is able to run. So if the VFD is normal, it's not in a fall condition, it's able to operate, the relay contact will close, signaling that all is well. If the VFD goes into a fault condition, the relay contact will open to indicate this situation. This again is one of those fail-safe arrangements. The idea here is if something goes wrong, like power supply fails or a wire gets cut, you will signal back that something is wrong. It's always better to do that than to say everything is fine when maybe it isn't. Drive running is similar, except it indicates whether the VFD is enabled or not. It doesn't necessarily indicate the motor is turning, but it indicates that the motor is at least able to be turning. The last two, motor at target speed and motor speed greater than zero, perform a comparison. If the motor is at the speed that you have programmed it to operate at, the relay contact will close. That means it's true that the motor is at target speed. Number three is similar, except it simply closes the relay contact if the motor speed is greater than zero. So you could consider this one kind of a motor turning indicator. Now, there is a parameter, and it's way off in parameter group six. It's parameter 6-04. It's called the tolerance band. It is a percentage that you set. You use it when you have option two or three selected, and the purpose of the tolerance band is to decide when the relay closes. It basically indicates if you're anywhere within a certain percentage of either the target speed or a speed of zero that the relay will close. The idea here is by having a tolerance, it will keep the relay from chattering if it's very close to that threshold. So you may need to tweak that if, if you're using option two or three. Now there are several options on this list that are called the comparison operations. These are configurable comparisons. What they do is they open or close the relay depending upon whether the motor's speed, current, or torque is above or below a limit. So these are the choices here. Notice they make comparisons. The limit is a percentage of the motor's maximum speed, its nominal current, or nominal torque. 
The relay contact will close when the comparison is true. So for example, if you pick option four, if the motor speed is greater than or equal to the limit value, then the relay will close. It will open when it falls below a limit. So there are actually two parameters you need to set up when you're working with limits. Parameter 2-16 and 2-17 are the upper and lower limit percentages for relay one. 2-19 and 2-20 are for Relay 2. We'll just take a look at Relay 1 here. So it is typically set to 100%. This is the upper limit. The lower limit is typically set to zero. So in other words, the relay will open and close at the extreme limits of the operation. Usually this is not useful, so you need to set these to something specific. So here's the idea, as the speed increases, when it crosses the upper limit percentage, the relay will close. The speed, of course, can then continue to increase to a higher speed, but the relay will remain closed. As the speed drops, it will eventually reach the lower limit. At that point, the relay will reopen. So notice you don't have these at the same place. You have a gap between them. This is called the hysteresis, and it's there to prevent the relay from chattering. If the upper and lower limit were set to the same value and you were right on the line, the relay would just keep clicking as it attempted to decide whether to open or close. So you should never set your two percentage values to the same value because that eliminates hysteresis. What will happen then, you'll get relay chattering. So they should be a percentage or two apart at least. Let's look at an example to see how this would work. Let's say we have an 1800 RPM motor and we want to set up our limits to watch for the motor speed rising above 750 RPM or falling below 250 RPM. So we would have to pick this option right here where we're looking for the motor speed to go above a limit. So we'd pick option four, we would set this up. Then we would calculate what 750 RPM is for an 1800 RPM motor. It is 41.7% of its top speed. 250 RPM is 13.9% of 1800 RPM. We would then go to parameter 2-16, assuming we're using relay one. We'd set it to 41.7. Notice you can go down to a tenth of a percent here. And then you set parameter 2-17, the lower limit, to 13.9%. Now at that point, if you operate your motor, here's what's going to happen. When the speed rises to 750 RPM, the relay will close. When the speed starts falling, it will not reopen when it crosses 750 RPM. It's going to wait until it reaches 250, at which point the relay will open. So there's a 500 RPM hysteresis in this setup, which is just fine. That will very definitely not cause chattering. Let's demonstrate this. I'm going to go into LT Shell and configure my VFD to implement what we've just looked at. So we'll go ahead and set that up and then we'll try it out and see if it works. Okay, well, let's go ahead and get that relay configured to implement the thresholds that we just calculated. I'm right where I was last time, so I'm just going to turn real time edit mode on and I'm going to roll down until I find our relays. And we're going to use relay number one for this. So here we are, here's our relays. Parameter 2-15 controls relay one's function. I'm going to change it from its default of drive healthy to motor speed greater than or equal to limit. So it will monitor the speed relative to the limits. So I do that first. Then I have to set the upper limits and lower limits. So I'm going to go ahead and set these. I'll change the upper limit to 41.7%, and I'll change the lower limit to 13.9%, and I'll turn real-time edit mode off. That's all I should have to do. So what will happen when the motor speed rises above 750 RPM? The relay should click and close, and when I slow the VFD down and it reaches 250 RPM, it should click and open up. Let's go and test that out and see if that happens. We can just continue to use the terminal control mode we're already in. We'll use the potentiometer to control the speed and we'll listen for the click. Here we go. All right, well, we're going to start our VFD up by turning digital input one on and using the speed control potentiometer to ramp up our speed. 
We're going to approach 750 RPM, and when we get there, we should hear the relay click as it crosses the threshold to trigger it into the on state. So here we go, getting close. And click, there we go, right on time. All right, we can keep increasing our speed here. And the relay is still closed. And now let's come back down. Remember, we're not going to reopen at 750. We're going to reopen at 250, which is our lower threshold. So we're getting close there. And click again, right where it belongs. So clearly that works. Okay, well, we're done with that. All is well. The last thing we're going to talk about in this session is controlling a brake. Brake motors can be very helpful because they can hold the load in position when the motor isn't running. We'll see how to control one of these with our MoviTrack LTPB. I'm going to begin this again with a warning. The brake control method that I'm about to show you is suitable only for horizontal holding type applications. It is not suitable for a vertical or angled hoist application. It is possible to control these applications with the MoviTrack LTPB. In fact, there's a dedicated hoist parameter that you have to turn on and a number of other parameters that you have to set. I'm not going to go through that. It's a fairly long, complicated setup. I recommend you consult the manual if you're working with a hoist and be sure you understand it because hoist applications, of course, can be dangerous if they're not set up correctly. So we're going to look at just a simple horizontal holding type brake. It's very easy to set up. Here's how you would do it. You would obviously connect your brake up to one of the relays, and I recommend relay number two. And I'll just mention there are several possible ways to do this. This is just one example, but this is one that people commonly use that generally works pretty well. What you'll do, you'll pick option four. So we're going to use a limit with this, actually two limits, an upper and lower limit. And here's the general behavior. We're going to set it up so when the motor starts turning and reaches a speed at least 2% of the maximum, the relay contact will close. This will release the brake. And when the motor speed drops below 1% of the maximum, the relay contact will open, engaging the brake. So this is going to cause the brake to either release or engage when we're fairly close to stopped condition. So what we'll do, we'll set relay 2's upper limit, which is parameter 2-19 to 2.0, that's 2%. And we'll set parameter 2-20, that's the lower limit, to 1.0, that's 1%. Now you may be looking at this and thinking this doesn't make any sense because if the brake is engaged and I start the VFD turning, it's not going to be able to turn. The brake's going to hold it. So how is it ever going to reach 2% in order to cause the brake to release? Well, you're right, that could be true, but the VFD does not actually know how fast the motor's turning. When you started operating, the magnetic field starts turning, and the VFD bases its speed on the rotation of the magnetic field. So even though the brake is actually holding the motor in place, when the magnetic field starts rotating at at least 2% of the motor's top speed, the VFD will believe the motor's turning. At that point, it will cross the limit, it will release the brake, and it will start turning in earnest. And everything should be just fine. Going to give you a few notes here. First of all, you may have to experiment with the limit values to get the desired brake behavior, so you may need to do some actual testing with the application, tweak those limits to make sure the brake is releasing and engaging at the right time. And you may also want to experiment with the stop mode. You may want to change it from ramp to stop to coast to stop or vice versa. The answer is here, do a little experimenting, do some thorough testing, be sure your application is doing what you expect. And with that, we're going to end this session. This is the end of session eight. Session nine, we're going to cover a variety of miscellaneous topics. We're coming into the home stretch of this class. We'll cover some miscellaneous topics. Then we're going to go on and look at some more advanced topics as we wrap the course up. So, see you next time.